thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists for, for sharing us sharing with us their time and expertise. And thanks for everyone else for coming to learn about something that is really important to, to Missouri. So this, this round table today is co-hosted by Most Policy Initiative and the Washington University um, Climate Change Program. So my name is Zach Miller and I am the program coordinator at Most Policy Initiative. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan group um, centered in Jeff City and the, the mission of our organization is to try to connect um, science to policy through a few different avenues. So we do that through working with legislators in the Capitol and then also through um, hosting discussions like these where we try to bring together partners from different groups to, to talk about um, policy problems that are relevant to Missourians um, right now. And yeah, Alex, you wanna tell us a little bit about WashU? Yes. Yes, um, so I'm Alex Morales Heil with the WashU Climate Change Program, and uh, we really draw together faculty, students, administrators, and community members um, across disciplines to promote climate action and really to serve as an interdisciplinary resource for climate research and curriculum. Uh, we really like to develop collaborations between students, faculty, and the greater community and prepare leaders for tomorrow. Um, today, uh, we'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that we gather on the ancestral lands of Native people. Um, I know we're all coming from different places across Missouri, uh, but uh, I come from St. Louis today, the land, um, uh, the lands of the Osage Nation, the Alini Confederacy, um, and Missouri people, um, as well as other tribes who have called what we know now as St. Louis, Missouri, their home, and were unjustly removed. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about climate-related disasters, including floods, um, that are specific to this land and the water systems that we are that um, within it. Um, the rivers and the floodplains where we reside have been defining features of this land for time immemorial. Um, and in fact, the word Missouri, um, after which our state is named, comes from the language of the Alini people, uh, meaning one who has dug out canoes um, and the Missouri people themselves or call themselves the Niwachi, which means um, people of the river's mouth. Um, so I, I wanted to share that with you today. Zach, I'll pass it back with you. Okay, thank you very much. And just a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. And so if you don't want your face to show up, then you can, you can keep your video off. Um, and please do keep yourself <laughs> muted, especially while panelists are talking. And if anybody has any questions at any point in time, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll try to answer them as, 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 we, as we go. So today on our round table, we have five different panelists and we'll give them each an opportunity to introduce themselves and then we'll get into a discussion. And again, feel free to throw us questions and we'll try to get to them at the end. So our first panelist is Karen McHugh. Good morning or good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to be a panelist. I'm Karen McHugh. I'm the Missouri State National Flood Insurance Program Coordinator and the Floodplain Management Section Manager for the state of Missouri. And then we have Connie Burnham. Good afternoon. Uh, I, too, want to thank you for inviting me to be a panelist. My name's uh, well, you already know my name, but I am the Emergency Management Coordinator for the University of Missouri Extension Program. And we have um, all of our offices um, are across the state and they are all part of the Emergency Management Program that we have uh, through the Extension Program. Thank you. And we have Bill Henson. Hi, I'm Bill Henson. I'm the Fire Chief of the University City Fire Department. I've been the Fire Chief here for or I've been with University City for 29 years, um, have uh, uh, just a little under 40 years in the fire service altogether, so. All right, thank you. And we have Eric Stein. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm a member of the University City Stormwater Commission, which was an outgrowth of a task force that uh, was appointed by the city council in 2018 to advise them on stormwater issues and of course, Flooding, overland flooding from the river to pair here in U City is a big part of that. 
Um, I'm basically retired. I'm a, a, an ex-engineer and a, a technical education instructor, taught at uh, State Technical College at Lynn for a number of years and retired several years ago from Rankin Technical College here in town. All right, thank you, Eric. And lastly, we have Dr. Elizabeth Friedman. Hi, um, so I am the Medical Director of Environmental Health at Children's Mercy in Kansas City and also the Director of the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit for um, our region, which includes Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, and Nebraska. Um, so yeah, this is, thank you for, for inviting me. I realize I'm from the other side of the state, but this <laughs> is something that we're dealing with throughout the state. And um, I'm really happy that I'm able to participate in this conversation today. Yeah, thank you all for coming. And with each one of these roundtables that we host, so this is a monthly series, we tried to pull together experts and um, researchers and anybody engaged in a particular topic from across the state. And it kind of just depends on what the topic is, where the folks who are engaged in that work are coming from. Um, but again, thank you all for coming. So we will go ahead and get started. Our topic today is the emergency response of climate related disasters. And so the first question I have is for Karen, and it is just big picture, which disasters affect Missouri the most? And, and I know you said you work mostly on floods. So can you tell us a little bit about um, when a flood becomes a disaster flood? Uh, yeah, it, it, you're right. The, the biggest dis, uh, disaster that we have in Missouri that we deal with is flooding, definitely. And um, <clears throat> We deal with all the flooding events, um, whether they're presidentially declared or not, and um, things that that uh, make the flooding event bad enough to have uh, a presidential declaration are uh, depends upon the amount of damage that's done throughout the state. So we have teams that go out uh, with FEMA, FEMA SEMA teams that go out and they collect the amount of damage. And if it reaches, reaches a certain threshold, uh, then the governor will ask for a presidential declaration. So not all flooding events are uh, presidentially declared disasters. Thank you, Karen. Um, Connie, can you um, talk to us a little bit about how climate change uh, affects disaster frequency and severity um, and which disasters as Missourians we should expect more of with climate change? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I, you know, as I was looking uh, through some information that Zach was able to, um, to give to me, it was uh, research that's done by our state climatologist at the University of Missouri. And um, I was reading through that, and of course, there's lots of graphs and all this sort of thing, you know, that go with that. But um, there's just um, a certain part of that that you know is kind of the takeaway from the whole report and so they talk about you know the assumptions are that you know with with climate change whatever the reasons are that there's going to be more intense rain events which means there's going to be more flooding and um and maybe flash flooding uh there's going to be um more fungus and disease outbreaks uh, there's going to be uh, stress on vegetation. And this, you know, when we think about vegetation, we think about agriculture and the, the food that is grown in the Midwest, the bread basket, and the effect that that can have on that. You can't, I mean, you know, if there's drought, uh, it's hard to water, you know, fields. And so therefore, you know, you're, you, you're going to have issues. If you have flooding, it's going to be the same thing. You know, you can only keep it back so long. And, you know, there's many, many pictures of all these floods that have affected farmland. So even if, you know, they survive through some of these sort of things, it just causes stress on that. It also causes stress on, um, on trees. And we need trees. I mean, for a variety of different reasons, but, you know, so our, so our, our, agriculture and all our tree management, you know, is very, very important. And so it provides, you know, it causes problems with that. And then it also, you know, a lot of pests and, you know, you've probably heard through the years, 
oh, uh, a good freeze and we'll get rid of whatever that varmint was that was flying around that we didn't want. And we find out that, oh gosh, we had those and they're still around. So survival of pests is going to increase and expansion into more regions because they're looking for a better habitat is what my assumption is. And so therefore, you know, we're, you know, we need to be vigilant and, and really thinking through these situations so that we know how it's going, who's it going to affect. And, and so that's going to be for all of us to, to consider. Yeah. Thank you, Connie. And, and related to that, Bill, could you tell us a little bit about um, what are the main steps of managing a disaster and, and who are the main actors um, in the state that help handle sure. that? Sure, there's um, kind of a national format that uh, we use uh, on the local level. It's also on the, uh, the FEMA and SEMA websites and that's um, uh, prevention, protection, mitigation, response and recovery. So like in prevention is identifying the potential hazards and taking the steps to prevent or limit the potential damage. Uh, mitigation is to re reduce the loss of life and protect property by identifying and reducing future disasters. Um, response is you respond quickly through a pre-planned action to quickly ease the human needs and recovery is the timely rest restoration while fortifying infrastructure, housing, health, and social and cultural needs. Um, again, depending on which level you're uh, reading this on, you know, this is more of a local level, kind of uh, the guidelines we've established for our area. Um, there's more added into each section as you go up through the, the state and federal levels on this uh, topic. Uh, as far as uh, what the roles are, um, you know, it starts on the local level here, like when we have an incident and then it reaches out to the regional mutual aid, like our area is region C area. Uh, region C communicates to the statewide mutual aid level uh, for help, and then, then we get into uh, uh, assistance from SEMA, which has four levels, which the lowest level is the support function only. Um, level three is partial activation with uh, command staff help, planning, logistics, and state agency support. Uh, level two is a full activation with all the uh, above plus additional technical support. And then level one is all the above with FEMA assistance. So it's kind of like a big funnel. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, and so along with, with that response, we know that a lot of these disasters have big implications for health. So Elizabeth, could you um, talk to us about how healthcare professionals prepare for these climate-related disasters? Sure. I guess I'd like to preface this by saying, you know, I, I think most of the folks, most of my co-panelists are, are health professionals, um, not in the traditional sense of working in a clinic, but um, everyone is working together to, you know, ensure safety. So um, I think they've answered it somewhat already, but from my perspective, Again, it depends on the professional focus, their expertise, and, and the disaster. Today we're talking about flooding. Um, so public health offices should be, hopefully are, assessing their emergency disaster response plan. They should be formalizing those plans in partnership with city planners and civil engineers, um, and together looking at infrastructure, the built environment, and the local environment, assessing those together in the context of a worst case scenario and an emergency preparedness plan should reflect a worst case scenario. Uh, so for example, we have a lot of coal ash piles that are often open to the elements. They contain harmful toxic chemicals. And if there's a flood, that contamination mixes with surface waters, which is where many of us get drinking water. So that's one type of preparedness that health professionals uh, would be considering. From a clinical perspective, uh, in the clinic as a physician, you know, we have opportunities to ensure our patients are prepared as individuals as opposed to that bigger community level. And that can be as simple as referring them to an emergency plan template for families. Um, there's one for from the American Academy of Family Physicians that I usually share with people. Um, for families that have chron a chronic disease patient that requires medications like insulin that have to be refrigerated or somebody in a wheelchair, that emergency plan would have more complex components and 
there's value in, in discussing that with families. Likewise, healthcare institutions, hospitals, and clinics should, should have emergency plans in place. So I guess there are a lot of different levels um, from the individual preparedness plan to that public health preparedness plan, which is really what we're talking about today. Thank you. And I think um, one of our uh, moderators, internet might be coming in and out. So I will go ahead with our next question. Um, uh, so as we're thinking about um, this being somewhat of a, a local to a larger regional question, question or issue, Connie, are there particular regions of the state that are more vulnerable than others? Um, and kind of maybe you can get into how that management the emergency management varies by rural and urban areas or by community de demographics? Uh, well, if you think about um, the state and how it's laid out, we have two major rivers on two sides of uh, the state. And so anybody who lives along the rivers have a chance of being flooded. And then of course we have uh, a lot of you know smaller rivers and creeks that become rivers when there's you know a lot of water that comes down. Uh, so your possibility, I mean, if you live close to a body of water, just like many of them found in uh, San Charles, St. Louis area, that said we would have never thought that we would ever have this situation that they do. So all of us who, who live around those areas need to be pretty careful and vigilant, you know, around there. But again, you know, a lot of the, the, the rivers are through rural parts of the state, a lot of farmland that's along there, but still, you know, can, can really experience major, major flooding from these two rivers. And so again, you know, it may not maybe affect them directly as far as maybe their home, but you may not even be able to get to your home, you know, because of the amount of water. So you may not live by one, but trying to get to where you want to go may not be, may be impossible. The other couple things that, you know, to think about is um, uh, the earthquake uh, potential for the state of Missouri and seven other states, the New Madrid seismic zone. It's not a small issue. Now, it hasn't, we haven't seen anything that has been anything major like it was in the 1800s, but it's still a great possibility. And there's, there is constant planning from the federal government to the state government to the local government uh, all the time. So it's not a forgotten um, issue, even though we haven't, you know, had a major earthquake. But, you know, if you think that this is only something that would maybe affect Southeast Missouri, you know, because of the composition of the soil, it goes all the way up from the bottom of Missouri to the top of Missouri on the eastern side. So if you're living in, in um, St. Louis, you're going to be affected by this. But not only will you be affected, because when you blow a hole into the middle part of the country, you're going to affect a lot of people and you're going to affect the infrastructure that is in the south part of the southeast part of the state which goes all the way up to Washington, D.C., which is why they consider it to be a, um, a security issue. Not only for, you know, just it's certainly inconvenient, but more that it is something more than that. And then um, also with droughts, I mean, you know, with more, uh, yes, we will have more rain, but then sometimes we will have more rain in the spring and then less in the summer. And so again, you know, we have droughts and these, they're, you know, even call them flash droughts. I mean, you know, one day it seems like you're not in that situation and the next you are. So anyway, so those are the, you know, some major issues that, you know, are confronting us, you know, each day. And so you're asking about how, you know, emergency management kind of like figures out what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. You know, funding is one of the big issues. I mean, a lot of these small uh, county uh, counties, uh, they may be big in, in acreage, but they cert certainly are not when it comes around to money to support emergency management. So there's always this balancing act, you know, how many, how, how often would we use your services basically? And Bill can I identify with this. 
you know, uh, because everybody has to, we have to have enough money to do all the other things as well. So if they, if there's a lot of repetition of, of disasters, then they probably have a little bit stronger emergency management program. But if not, then it's kind of like, well, we could use this money for something else instead. So it's a balancing act out there. And again, there's no steady found, you know, foundation or funding for a lot of these areas. Thank you, Connie. Um, so um, Karen, maybe you could pick up a little bit um, talking about uh, the flood in 2019 in Missouri and, and how it affected um, or impacted communities and regions differently across the state. There we go, had to get unmuted. <laughs> Uh, so 2019 was really a, a big learning experience for us. It, it came down the Missouri River and uh, then crossed the state and hit the Mississippi River over on the east. Um, what we found out was we, we had taken on a huge project of working with our 681 NFIP participating communities to get them prepared for the next flooding event. Um, and we had put a lot of effort into training and uh, substantial damage plans and planning and, do, and going out and doing a lot of uh, pre-disaster workshops. And when that flood hit in 2019, it hit a lot of our more rural, uh, what we would call underserved communities, and they were not prepared. Some of our little towns were 100% uh, in the floodplain and they were 100% uh, inundated with flood water. So um, we realized we had to define um, the difference between our rural underserved communities and our more uh, urban communities that are more prepared because they have bigger staff and, and they have some, some of them even have dedicated floodplain administrators. So one of the things that uh, we, I applied for with through our grant, my section is, is funded by the CAP SASE grant. It's a grant from FEMA. Um, and it's a very small grant. Uh, I applied for a discretionary project and was granted uh, that project to create a uh, quick guide for the citizens of Missouri in those underserved communities. Um, it, it's written in their language, in the everyday uh, language of Missourians. Um, we had to take some of the FEMA verbiage and, and, and change it into something that everyday folks could understand. And we came up with a really fantastic quick guide to help our folks uh, recover from a flooding event. And uh, it starts uh, from, I've just now flooded, what now? And how do you get home safely? And once you're home uh, safely, then how do you remain safe? in your home and what are the next steps and who's knocking at your door and okay you're substantially damaged now what so it's very comprehensive and i think that um we're going to post a link to this sema.dps.mo.gov website where you can go onto our website and download that document if you're interested in seeing it it's it's excellent and we've so far um, we There we go. Thank you, Zach. Uh, we have given out hundreds of these uh, documents to uh, the people in uh, Missouri and to the community leaders. So uh, 2019 was a, a big learning year for us, and hopefully now we've prepared and um, the next flooding events we're going to be uh, better prepared for. Thank you so much. Um, and sorry about the internet problems. Bill, <laughs> next question is for you. Um, if we could pivot from rural areas to urban areas and a flood that was a little more recent, could you tell us a little bit about the flood that uh, St. Louis faced a couple months ago? Sure. Um, uh, let me start by, uh, you know, like I said, I've been here 30 years. We've had flooding issues along the river to pair pretty much the whole time I've been here. But these floods started out 
um, with just a couple of apartment, apartment complexes that we would have to go out and we would be knee deep in the water and we'd have to shut off everybody's gas and uh, move 40 residents uh, temporarily. Um, 10 years later, we are looking at them same apartments and now streets a block or two away that are starting to flood. The water is getting more rapid. We're waist high and uh, we're starting to carry life jackets and life ropes that we didn't have to carry before. Um, up to today where we have life dry jackets, dry suits, helmets, rafts, all things we didn't have to have 30 years ago because these events weren't as uh, spectacular, I guess you'd say. Um, so the this last flood in particular, um, um, from my local point of view, the River de Pere is basically a drainage area. Um, it divided uh, University City basically in half. You couldn't go from the north side of University City to the south side of University anywhere in this town without going into a neighboring town, sometimes half a mile to three quarters of a mile away to come all the way around to get to the other side of it. Um, like I said, we went from this affecting one apartment complex and then one apartment complex and a few houses to today where this last one was over 300 residents and I'm not for sure exactly how many businesses were affected. And of course, you know, when you affect uh, large areas like that, recovery takes a lot longer. You know, you gotta, you gotta have the, the resources to uh, mitigate the issues and for these people to rebuild, uh, which then affects the economic growth of the area. So, you know, and, and the tax base of, um, that comes into the area, like uh, the city of University City alone, just in um, the city's own buildings and equipment was over $18 million in damage. And Thank Connie, you. Um, go so ahead. I was just going to say, Connie, um, build, building on that, so with more, more severe weather events that are happening more frequently, how has that affected emergency management um, at, at, through the MU extension? Well, you know, our disaster work is not our first line of work <laughs> with extension. So it is, um, you know, uh, another layer of something that, you know, we participate in. I, I mean, this is my full-time job, so I'm working with it all the time, but, our, you know, our county um, faculty, are busy doing other things. And then this impacts the work that they do. Because again, when something like this happens, I always say, if you think you're gonna continue on doing your work, you're probably not. Because when a disaster hits your communities, you know, you stop and everybody stops. Nobody's gonna go to, you know, a class. Nobody's gonna go to this or do this or whatever because they're dealing with a, a disaster in their community. So it really, I mean, so it does, and I'm, and I'm not making that sound like it's not important because it is vitally important. As, as I always say, if you help someone during a disaster, um, you're probably going to be remembered more for that than any of the other work that you normally do. Bill probably can uh, attest to that, Karen, you know, Elizabeth, all of us in the same way. It's because, you know, we bring something to the most dire situations to help. And that's what they're gonna remember. They're not gonna remember that Bill sends his people in to see how many people have extension cords running in, you know, and, and shouldn't have those all connected. They don't remember that. What they remember is that Bill's uh, um, firefighters came in and rescued people and, and took care of people. So it, it, it does, it, it affects every one of us in the work that we do because we're trying to do all the preparedness stuff and then all of a sudden it happens. You know, we've been preparing for it. Now, now all of a sudden we're in the recovery or, or the response and then the recovery, which takes forever. People just forget that. If you've never been involved in it, all of a sudden you go on with your life. You're going to the soccer games, you're going to this, you're doing that. People are still struggling, trying to figure out how are they even gonna get their house cleaned out, much less repaired, so. Right. And if I could interject one more thing into that is that this last flood was well outside the areas marked as a floodplain. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of people affected who don't have flood insurance and have no idea what to do and, or, or the uh, resources to take care of it themselves. 
Um, our our uh, our phones have been um, the message messages that it holds have been full almost every day for for, for about a month and a half with people just not know, having any clue on what to do. Oh, sorry, I, I got a little lost in my document. Um, so, um, Eric, I wanted to come to you um, as we were talking about um, kind of all these different levels of responses. Um, if you could maybe help us think a little bit about um, about the individual versus the public responsibility and um, kind of what responsibility do individual homeowners have versus the collective uh, public responsibility. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, um, you know, that can be a tricky mix. You see this debate in public on, on other issues. What do you collectively expect uh, through government services to be provided and what do you provide for yourself? And there are certain things that individual homeowners could do to help themselves. Obviously, flood insurance, if you live in or close to a, an area, is, is one of those things. Um, uh, but uh, people are affected by flooding by a lot of things beyond their control. You know, we get more and more building to the west of us and more and more water dumped into the River de Pere, which is, is a ferocious flash, uh, flash flooding stream. Uh, individual people can't control that. Um, and so you're looking for uh, help from things that are beyond the individuals. And then also on the commission, we, we're looking... Uh, at you know what what can individual jurisdictions do? And the you know, first thing that people think of when we have a disaster like this last one is, gee, will somebody buy me out? And everybody's applying for buyout money, and it's very competitive and it's hard to come by. What, what can the individual communities do on a smaller scale that might help? And uh, you know, that's we for instance instituted this flood warning system. Uh, uh, National Weather Service warnings are fine as far as they go, but they cover the St. Louis area and the response that's expected to the typical urban stream. We wanted something that was calibrated specifically to the river to pair that would give us a heads up of imminent flooding. So we know it's time to run for cover. And we did manage to put together uh, a system. I won't go into a lot of the detail on it. It gets a little geeky, but I did uh, attach a link to our uh, public portal where you can see details on the system. But uh, this fits into you know, two people, two, two, two parties that need this, it could certainly help Chief Henson and his folks. Now, they've been wonderful in the past about being proactive. When they look out the window and see and it's raining like heck and has been for two hours, they're usually out scouting the trouble areas, uh, anticipating possible trouble. But this, you know, you can't always tell what you see in front of you because a lot of it depends on what's happening in the rest of the watershed two or three miles west of us, which goes all the way out to Creek Corps. So, the flood warning system will give them a much more take a lot of the guesswork out of knowing when a flood is coming and our experience in the uh, this is a prototype system by the way it's been in development phase since november it's working very well and specifically in these recent events we had four rainfalls sufficient to induce flash flooding here and it made the correct call four out of four times with about 45 or 50 minutes warning uh, before the flood reached dangerous levels so this gives our emergency responders, uh, takes a little bit of the guesswork out of when they need to be uh, on site. And it also helps the uh, public safety of our citizens. Most common question I get when I'm out and around is why didn't somebody warn me about this? And uh, I, I believe chief, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in some of those apartments, your guys were in there and it was six feet deep inside and they were swimming, uh, extracting some of the folks from these apartments because they didn't know it was coming. So uh, we think uh, things like the warning system could help. We also think uh, there are things individual homeowners could do to increase the resilience of their property uh, to flooding. And that's really not being promoted as much as it should be. The emphasis always is on buyouts, but there are, uh, you know, if you, if you have flooding that's just due to a flash flood that comes up and say a couple of feet on your foundation and lasts for maybe an hour and it's gone, but it comes down a walkout stairwell or in the basement windows and fills your basement. And even in an unfinished basement, by the time you replace water heater, HVAC, get a black water clean out and all the electrical wiring, you're looking at tens of thousands of dollars. 
unnecessarily so. It could have been prevented in some cases by things like glass block windows, eliminating the walkout stairwell or putting a flood barrier around it, uh, maybe backup protection on a basement drain from overcharged sewers by the over, overland flooding. These things can be done. I, they're really not being stressed as much as they should have. That would have saved many new city people a lot of heartache uh, and a lot of expense. Uh, if it's main floor flooding, repeated main floor flooding, there's not much you can do. You're, you're looking at buyouts is the only way to, to really fix that. Thank you, Eric. I, I wanna go back to that point of communication. And this, this question is open to the whole panel, whoever feels like they can um, answer it. And that is like, where should Missourians turn for turn to for communication? So it sounds like you guys have an, an, a system that's working pretty well in St. Louis, but for somebody in rural parts of the state or in Kansas City, um, is there a one-stop shop place that they can turn to for emergency information? i tell you one thing that uh, we do in this area is we have a, it's a, it's an early alerting, early warning or alerting system, excuse me, um, where the city uh, bought this program and they're able to, uh, they're able to send out everyday messages or emergency messages. And these emergency messages can be detailed all the way down to a certain building or a certain block or a certain uh, region of the city or an area, you know. It, it doesn't, uh, it's geofenced. Um, it's actually on our, the, the commanders of the police and fire department cell phone. So we can send out alerts to evacuate areas. We can geofence these areas so that people inside that area get the alerts. Now, the downside to that is people have to sign up for it. We advertise and advertise and advertise and still the percentage of people that live in this city, it's free to them, but the percentage of people that live in this city that uh, haven't uh, downloaded this app is, is a, a phenomenal amount compared to uh, what we have signed up for. It. Now, the ones that have signed up for it that night got the alert and a lot of them got out before their house flooded. So um, it's, it's, it's a matter of um, making them aware of a program. Um, and there's the, these programs, there's two or three of them out there. And any community can buy into these programs and have it dedicated to their area to where they just reach the people in their area. So uh, it's something that every community needs to look into. It's not, it's not an expensive issue either. Well, in Boone County, this is Connie, but in Boone County where I live, Columbia, um, we have uh, enhanced 911. And that again is, uh, you know, an opting in to the uh, system but it too will send out alerts if there are issues. Now, not every county might have enhanced 911, but if they do, I would think that it would be, you know, everyone would be eligible to, to use something like that. But Bill just brings up a good point. We take none of this preparedness really upon ourselves. <laughs> We're just too busy doing everything else. And even though we hear about it and we are spend time on Facebook and all the other things, I mean, these are the things that should be on Facebook constantly, you know, but even if they are, people just don't do anything about it and because they don't think it's going to affect them. So for the other side of the state, I was formulating a response, but I see that we have someone from the KCMO emergency management team on the call. So they may be able to provide a better answer than I could since I haven't actually been in Kansas City for too long. So can we, can we invite an audience member to answer that? Yeah, if you're, if you're interested in joining, um, you can turn your sound off and, and um, share your answer if you'd like. And if not, you can, you can decline. Hmm. I was referring to Allie Breeze. Yep, there we go. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm here. I had, sorry, I had, some people are leaving our office right now. So um, I was right in the middle of that. I apologize. Um, but are you asking for notification systems or information systems? Is that what the question was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's, yeah. what's available in Kansas City um, for in terms of communication? 
And so we have several, again, I, I don't think there is one, one, uh, one stop shop type of thing. We have Alert KC, which does, if you opt into that, it does cover, you know, city events, extreme weather events, um, and also the National Weather Service. Um, we have our Alert KC system Oops. set up that it will automatically re broadcast over the Alert KC notifications to those subscribers, anything that the National Weather Service puts out when, the, when there's extreme weather. So we automatically repost that. So we try and provide um, the most information we can. And then Mid-America Regional Council has, they have um, on uh, Prepare Metro KC, their website, um, preparemetrokc.org. And they provide a lot of good information and resources. Um, and the region kind of, we all kind of together feed that uh, based on what we find the most common needs are, questions are, hazards that are coming, things like that. So those are some things, some things we do and that we um, also advertise, you know, like we try and put it on our social media for Alert KC and, and provide other resources of information. Thank, thank you so much, Allie, for joining in and, and sharing that with us. Um, Connie, can you could you talk to us a little bit about what types of programs and policies are out there for um, at the different levels, um, particularly resources that um, you would point for fam point point out for families or communities for um, being prepared. Well, there's a number of them, and you know, there's some on our um, extension website. <clears throat> and those are um, under extension.missouri.edu, and I can put that in the chat box. But SEMA has a really good website. If you go through it, it'll give you information about all kinds of issues, all kinds of things that you can do. There's videos, things like that. You know, they've got the information right now on there about um, if you're, you know, have applied for assistance through FEMA, through the um, uh, individual assistance program, things like that. So there's very current information that's up there. FEMA has an immense amount of um, training materials and also uh, planning um, materials that are there, you know, all, templates for all kinds of, you know, all the way from, you know, a family, all, you know, all the way to businesses and everywhere else. We have some of those same things. And then, you know, local government might have some of those on their websites, you know, that they're just linking to uh, FEMA or to SEMA or to Extension and saying, here, you can find this. So there, and Red Cross, I mean, you, you can't, you know, you can't throw a rock without hitting uh, some, some organization that has some of these same things there. So it just is a matter of people you know, looking for those particular types of um, items. So they're not hard to find, but again, people meet, need to be motivated in order to find them. So they're, they are out there. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. And, and Karen, speaking to the, the state and federal level, at what point does SEMA kick in? And then at what point does FEMA kick in? And, and how do folks who have been impacted by disasters receive support from? Uh, well, I, I think Bill gave a, a pretty good uh, description of the uh, when we get uh, SEMA activated, but um, with the flooding, uh, if it, if we're just speaking regarding flooding, uh, the floodplain management section gets involved immediately. Um, as soon as we get the first report of heavy rains coming, we start watching the National Weather Service and local channels to find out if there actually was a flooding event. Um, then we start contacting the communities immediately. And then, um, if the damage was, uh, I think I mentioned before, if there's enough damage, the, the, the SEMA FEMA teams will go out and look at the amount of damage. And then <clears throat> if there is a presidential declaration and then FEMA becomes extremely involved like they are right now in, in uh, the St. Louis area, there's several joint field offices that are, have been stood up in the St. Louis area. 
So <clears throat> state is involved immediately and FEMA becomes involved when there is a presidential declaration. Um, in between that, um, we, have, uh, we are able to work with our region for help and advice uh, at the state level. Okay, thank you. And we just have a question in the chat from Dan Barry. Um, and he asks, with rapidly changing climate and weather realities, is there a potential role for local scientists to, to support state and local planning efforts with downscaled data slash analysis? Um, could any of you speak, speak to that question? I guess one thing that, that I would mention based on pulling in scientists to, um, to facing problems like this is like, I do know that MU just established the, the Missouri Water Center, which um, at the University of Missouri, it pulls in the departments of engineering and natural resources and connects those researchers with people who are engaged in water management at the state and federal level. So like with Army Corps of Engineers and with other actors in that scene. And so I think there is some, some movement towards that. And, and also Mike Parson last year uh, slated some money towards an up-to-date data system that people can use to access uh, flooding and drought realities across the state in real time and use that information to uh, inform management. So I think some of that is happening right now in Missouri. Yeah, I might also say that, uh, you know, this the use of the Stormwater Commission uh, formed by the city council made up of citizen volunteers. Um, the six people on that are all scientists or engineers. And uh, um, so it might be possible to also recruit help like that locally that can help you with technical issues such as setting up a flood warning system and so forth. There, there are a number, number of other groups um, that are working to bridge that divide between you know, scientific expertise and on the ground action um, nationally and regionally. So shameless plug, Missouri Clinicians for Climate Action, which is at its inception, is a group that's intended to do just, you know, just what you're describing, um, Dan. The title doesn't lend itself to that as well, but the goal is to um, support local communities um, and really bring a lot of those federal resources into Missouri so that we are better prepared um, as a region. I'd like to speak a little bit to the fact that I, I think on the on our local our local communities do not take advantage many times of the expertise that's out there. People have before they uh, people all have a background. And so like Bill, I mean, like Eric and Bill, but, you know, you have a background in something. And so a lot of times emergency management and maybe government doesn't even think about the fact of who could we contact? I mean, I live in the world of academia, University of Missouri. I mean, come on, you know, uh, these folks should be fully engaged and I'm not sure that they are. The other thing is a lot of times government will look and say, well, we'll hire a contractor to come in and, uh, you know, and, and to, to do this work and a lot of money that gets put out and it could have been done with the expertise that might be in the local areas. So, I mean, I think that too many times we think that somebody with a briefcase that lives, you know, a hundred miles away have a better idea how to help us than some of the things that we already have within our own communities that we could access and start asking questions. Hey, uh, do you have anything like this that we might be able to use? Thank you. Um, kind of uh, moving in this direction of, of resilience, um, and I'm just gonna post this uh, for, for anyone who wants to jump in. Uh, what does um, a resilient, community or city or landscape in Missouri look like to you? Um, what are some of the steps that we might take in Missouri um, to be resilient? Well, I guess I've already hit this. Uh, I'll just say again, I think we're not doing enough at the local level to help some homeowners uh, uh, 
no steps they could take to make their homes more resilient to flooding. I just don't think we're doing enough at that level. It's not going to work for everyone, but there are a significant number of properties where flood damage could have been really minimized uh, in U City instead of the thirty or forty thousand dollars they're having to pay for a basement flooding problem that could have been easily avoided. And I think we need to do more uh, in, in that kind of lower tech. Uh, uh, area of advising locally. I, I think there's also, um, well, I have a few, a few responses. Um, I think this really gets to what Connie just said and what Dan has asked about, um, and really what the, the most um, policy initiative is working towards, which is bridging those divides between um, technical expertise and that lived experience on the ground and bringing those groups together. Um, and while you know, we haven't been really effective at doing that in the past, I think this one existential crisis and two, a lot of federal funding being made available to do this, to support this kind of work. I think we're sort of at a, um, we're at a point in history where we have this really great opportunity to um, come together and work together more effectively to, um, to be more resilient regionally. I, I have to agree with what she said because like, um, you know, as, as chief officers, all of St. Louis County, we, we have a north, south, east and central region. And we're in the central core area, the central core chiefs, which are the local chiefs around the area, we meet and discuss the issues that we see. We talk about the issues that may come up <clears throat> and how we're gonna to respond to them. Now, after that meeting, we sit down, uh, all these North, South and Central cores come together to have a meeting countywide to discuss what they've talked about and what they've talked about may be their issues in their area and how we as an area can fix that. Um, I think that works the same way on the local level with uh, like they were saying, you know, um, you know, you bring in the, the firemen and the policemen and uh, the people that are on the streets, even your street departments and your, uh, your parks departments, people and say, what have you seen? What are our problems and where are they at? You know, then you bring in the, 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 uh, the, the scientists and the engineers and say, here's what we're looking at as, as our problems and here's our potential problems. Where do we go as a group from here? I have a question that um, just came up based on your response, Eric, and some of what you guys have, have mentioned. Um, so last year, one of one of the fellows at Most Policy Initiative wrote a science note on flood resilience. And, and in that work, we, we came across some research that showed that oftentimes the most um, high risk flood areas have the most vulnerable communities there. So that might be the, the lowest socioeconomic class that can't afford to make their homes more resilient or if they are renting a place, um, they, they certainly can't change the, the structure that they're in. So just off the cuff, do you guys have any ideas of, of how to access those groups and, and like to, to, to help build resilience um, among a community that maybe can't take on that work independently? Well, um, I wish I did actually. Uh, again, I think something like the Stormwater Commission can be somewhat helpful there. I mean, we have, we've been planning now for several months and we're probably gonna, we've been kind of preoccupied to, with an Army Corps study uh, going on here, but uh, the commission is now getting ready to start some public information uh, sessions where we address some of these various things. Uh, with the public, specific steps they could take. Uh, in the case of rental, that's particularly thorny. I, I don't know the answer to that, but certainly people who are owning their own property, um, uh, you know, uh, we, we would be in a position to, to, to advise them. Um, these type of remediations don't work well for all properties. You need a certain level of expertise uh, involved to, to determine whether or not uh, some of these floodproofing methods are appropriate for a particular property or not. 
And I'm not sure exactly who should provide that. We have people on the commission that, that could, uh, in some cases, maybe cities do, um, you know, but there might need to be some outside money or some grant money available perhaps, um, you know, to bring in some, some professional help with that type of thing. But a lot of it could be done, I think, at the local level. And the amount of money involved for the protection you get is much less than what you're talking about for, for buyouts for some of these properties that have simpler flooding problems. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. This is Karen. And um, one of the, the problems is uh, with the National Flood Insurance Program is that um, we allow up to a one foot rise in the uh, base flood elevation. And um, we need to have some really very good uh, reform to the National Flood Insurance Program and uh, the reauthorization uh, is being kicked around again. And uh, we need, we just need, there's a difference between what we should do and what we have to do. Um, and if we change the, what we have to do is um, in the National Flood Insurance Program, then um, I think we can better protect people's lives in their property and um, try to make an effort to stop this cycle of flood, rebuild, flood. It, it just it, it happens over and over and over again. And the people I talked to on the phone, the woman last week said, well, I flooded seven times. Why are you flooding seven times? If you're not substantially damaged, uh, you should be listening to Eric who has some ideas about how you can retrofit your property and your, uh, you know, and do some things to help you uh, keep from flooding again seven more times next year. So yeah. uh, there needs to be some good reforms and um, not enough time to talk about, talk about them. So. Yeah, well, that's okay. Thank you, Karen. We'll, we'll put a, a, we'll send out a follow-up email with a lot of resources for folks. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. For everybody who is attending, thank you guys for coming. I'm dropping an evaluation in the chat. If you would be so generous to give us some data so we can use that to make these better in the future, we would really appreciate it. We host these every month. Next month, we'll be talking about um, broadband in Missouri, so please do come. I want to close out with um, asking each of the panelists to just give us a, a one or two sentence takeaway based on their experience and, and some of what we've talked about this session, um, maybe some advice they would have or recommendations they might have to make the state more resilient. And that could be at the family level or all the way up to the state level. So I'll let you guys volunteer to, to offer your, your advice as we close it out. Uh, this is Karen and my advice is simple. Whether you're in a high risk area or a low risk area, Buy flood insurance, protect your investment, protect your property. Uh, this is Bill. Um, what, I, what I would say is that, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, we talked about it earlier before we got on, as you know, there's a, a normal 15-man uh, crew that's taking care of a city of 40,000 people. And when something, when a big disaster happens like this, uh, citizens really need to learn how to take care of themselves until we can get there. There's basic things at each home they need to know how to do, and they need to know what to pack uh, in a hurry. So um, as far as the department, we're doing that. We do education and we do home safety evaluations, but um, education is the key. Uh, knowing your home, knowing your routes to get out, knowing what disasters may affect you is, is, a, is a big deal. Well, September is preparedness month. And so I will say the same thing that we've said all along. It complements what Bill just said is build a kit, make a plan, stay informed. If you do those sort of things, you're going to be much better off. Elizabeth, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but you're muted. Yeah. Um, wouldn't be me if I didn't go against the grain. So I agree with all of the things that people have said, having a plan, practicing the plan, 
all of those things are valuable. Um, that said, a lot of folks don't have the time and the bandwidth to do that when they're working 40 to 80 hours a week, plus raising families, plus trying to maintain. So I think that there is huge value in engaging in policy uh, locally and regionally. Um, so my ask for the audience is to vote. And, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, uh, on the River de Pere, I guess in the past 20 some years, we've had probably about nine uh, serious flood events and two thirds of them have occurred since 2015. This is, this is getting worse for whatever reason. And uh, we need to address it at all levels. And again, the theme I'm pushing is we need to do as much locally as we can with the resources that we have locally and people that might be willing to, to volunteer and help out locally. Okay, thank you guys so much. Again, we'll send out um, an email with, with a bunch of resources that were mentioned in this, in this discussion. A big thank you to all of our panelists for coming and for all of the attendees for, for coming to listen to discussion about a topic that is really important. If any of you have suggestions for the kinds of things that you would like us to cover in one of our future roundtables, please send us a, an email. You can, you can reach us through our website, mostpolicyinitiative.org. Um, and yeah, thank you all for coming. We greatly appreciate it. And we'll see, you, you. see you next time. Thank you.